Well, good morning, First Presbyterian Church. Welcome to our first of hopefully only a few of completely virtual services. But as we protect one another's health and take care of each other, we also want to make sure that we have the opportunity to worship the Lord our God. There's a couple of announcements I want to bring to your attention. That is, we continue to have the Giving Tree in the Narthex. It's also online on a website. And you can click on one of those things, say, I'll take care of that kid, that need, etc., and bring that here to the church. Or just call me or call Michelle. Somebody will come and get it from your house if you don't feel comfortable doing that. Also, this weekend at the Cannonballers Field down here, we have the Trees of Hope. And our kids have decorated a tree, and it's available for you to look at, and uh, I hope you'll be part of that. And I should also mention now that our Christmas Eve service will be virtual. You can call friends from across the country who used to come here and say, you can watch at this show. Well, I hope you'll enjoy this time as we worship the Lord our God. Let's take a few moments to meditate on his presence, his power, and his glory. Maker of the stars of night, of the sun by day, rise in us and bring your light, burn our shadows away, in the darkness where we dwell, we await the of God, Emmanuel. 
our call to worship. During Advent, we wait for the coming Savior, who is our Prince of Peace. The Lord gives strength to his people and blesses them with peace. In the midst of conflict, we look to the one who brings harmony. The Lord gives strength to his people and blesses them with peace. In the midst of confusion, we look to the one who brings clarity. The Lord gives strength to his people and blesses them with peace. In the midst of division, we look to the one who brings unity. The Lord gives strength to his people and blesses them with peace. In the midst of separation, we look to the one who restores the broken. The Lord gives strength to his people and blesses them with peace. Today, we light three candles. The first candle reminds us of our hope in knowing Jesus as our wonderful counselor. The second candle reminds us of our joy in proclaiming Christ as our mighty God. We light the third candle to remind us that Jesus is our Prince of Peace. In a world filled with conflict, tension, and discord, we look for the peace that comes through Christ alone. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Emmanuel, Emmanuel. Gracious Lord, as we continue our Advent journey, we acknowledge that our surroundings are often far from peaceful. By your Spirit, help us to be agents of peace in the world around us. Throughout this season, continue to fill us with the peace that surpasses all understanding. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time behold him come, offspring of the virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with us to dwell. Jesus, our Emmanuel, hark the herald angels sing, glory. 
now go to our prayer of confession. Join me in prayer. Lord of Christmas peace, we have done wrong. We have tarnished the gift you gave freely. We have buried you so deeply in our hearts the world doesn't see you. We have lived lives of apathy against your love. We have built fences and fortresses to push people away. We have been blind to those in need. Forgive us and heal us for the sake of Jesus. Amen. I have good news. Unto us, unto every single one of us, a child is born. He knew who we were, and he came anyway. He came out of love, and he receives you in his love. Praise God. Let's take a moment now to talk about the prayer concerns of our church. This list is pretty long. We lift up uh, Bob Hallman and family and the passing of Bob's sister, Mary Lou Cheryl. Gail Burgess is Mike Lauder's sister. She's in the hospital with COVID. Hospice care is beginning. Anna Claire is the granddaughter of Barbara Hancock. She has COVID-19. Lenise Ramsey, cousin of Mark Goodnight, throat cancer. Sherry Blackman, neighbor to the Strickers. She's had a heart and lung transplant. I don't know how she's doing this week, but I'm sure it's been a long haul. Tammy Ford is a friend of the Strickers in the hospital with COVID-19. And Cindy Fisher, mother of Lucinda Stewart, is at transitional of Annapolis with COVID-19 and pneumonia, and she's doing much better with breathing, breathing treatments. Sam, Escal Sam McAllister, two grandchildren recovering from COVID, and of course, Lori, his daughter, who is struggling with her MS. Uh, Farrah Griggs, he is recovering, and we can praise God for that. It's, he's not all there, but he's getting there every day. Uh, Susan Gibson, daughter of Don Law, Frank Gibson, who's on, undergoing uh, treatment for cancer. Crystal, Crystal Tresia, yeah, Tresia, friend of uh, Charity Lauder, breast cancer, has begun radiation treatments. Amy Ritchie, friend of Jane Jacobs, undergoing new chemo treatment at Duke. Roxanne DeBoard, daughter of Tony and, Ju and Judy Hunter. Wade Nunnery, father of Karen Pless. Barbara Kofi, friend of Judy Hunter. So those are a few names we know of, and I'm sure you're aware of others. So we bring these folks whom we love and other circumstances to our God in prayer. Would you join with me? <clears throat> Lord God, we've, na we've named names. But you know these people. You know their circumstances. You know the need. And so, God, we ask that you would be the God of healing and restoration and wholeness. That you would be the God of comfort in these many situations where now so many 3,000 and more are dying every day in our country and around the world. God, as we come through these political divisions and these difficult times, be with us. Allow us to be on a steady course, a course of peace, a course of coming together, a course of justice. And God, when we don't know the way forward or we don't know what to do, when Christmas comes this time wrapped in a surgical mask, and we don't feel like we can truly get our hands around it. Remind us that you have gotten your hands around us. And when the disciples were, as we are, somewhat confused about their situation, they didn't really feel they were even good at praying. They said, how should we pray? And you taught them to pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive the debts of others. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You're having a great day. So I have a question for you this morning. And I really want you to think about it. What are you afraid of? Now, lots of people are afraid of lots of different things, but I thought about some things that you might be afraid of. Maybe you're afraid of the dark. Um, sometimes when we're little, we're afraid of monsters or things hiding in our house. Sometimes we're afraid of storms, like thunderstorms or tornadoes or hurricanes. So what do you do when you're afraid? Well, if you're afraid of the dark, you might put up a nightlight. If you're afraid of monsters, you might check under your bed or in your closet before you go to sleep. If you're afraid of thunderstorms, you might hang close to mom and dad when it's thundering and lightning. Well, have you ever been afraid of God? I have. I remember when I was younger, I was afraid that I would do something to mess up and that God wouldn't love me anymore, or maybe not as much. Well, today's scripture shows us some other people who were afraid. The shepherds were out in the fields, just minding their own business, watching their sheep. And an angel of the Lord appears, and then a bunch of angels of the Lord appear, and the Bible says they are terrified. But the message of God is fear not. And over and over again in the Bible, God tells us that we don't need to fear. But this time, he says, don't fear because unto you a child is born. Unto you a son is given. A savior is born. Jesus is finally here. The Bible also says that perfect love casts out fear. And that means when we have perfect love, we don't have a reason to fear. And the only way we have that perfect love is through Jesus. See, even when we turn on a nightlight or check under our bed or go to mom and dad when we're scared... That doesn't get rid of our fear. We still have that fear. We're just calming it down a little bit. But if we have God with us, then there is no fear. See, I think that's why God sent Jesus as a baby, or maybe one reason he sent Jesus as a baby. He knows we're afraid of things, and he knows sometimes we're afraid of him, or maybe we don't understand him. But he sent a baby, some, somebody that could be cuddled, somebody that could be loved, somebody that cried, somebody that got angry, somebody that we can relate to because we know that he, came that he came to be us, he came to be with us, and he loves us that much. So the next time you get scared, think about those angels and think about God's message and think about his perfect love that was shown to us in Jesus. And fear not. Let's pray. Lord God, there are so many things in this world to be afraid of, but you tell us over and over again in the Bible to fear not. Let us listen to those words. Let us remember those words every time we are tempted to doubt, every time we're tempted to be afraid. And let us come to you, not with fear, but with awe and reverence and love for this great thing that you have done. And we are forever grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. We well, can see this little forest of poinsettias we have around here. Thank you for your giving of these, and we're, they uh, adorn this sanctuary. Very lovely. Crazy times, isn't it? I saw a, I guess it's a political cartoon, not very political, but it shows a snow globe with a family inside it, and, and the, the thing was not called a snow globe, but a no globe, because there's no dining at restaurants, no going out, no this, no that, that that's what this year is about. I thought, well, that's pretty accurate. As I come up to preach, our message is prepare him room, room in our night. And I thought of that, 
idea, room in our night, room in our darkness, because how many times have you heard that we are going to be going through or we are going through some dark days? I mean, we were already in a pandemic surge, then came Thanksgiving, and those numbers are only starting to come in as people fall ill, and that will be another bump. We're surrounded by stories of death and dying. We hear about a dearth of ICU beds and the strain on our health workers and that anyone, anywhere, who simply walks by you, you have to assume, has the virus. You don't want to be breathing the same air. And so the darkness is everywhere. And this, of course, is the darkest time of the year. When the days are short, we know that Jesus is the light that shines in the darkness, and oh, how we need that light now. Our Christmas story often begins where we began ours this season with these words from Isaiah, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. So it is no coincidence that darkness shows up in our Christmas story. Our segment today is set in the dark of night. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, allow that which is familiar to speak something that is of this moment and representing all eternity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I have three F's for you today. Fear not. It's for you, and find him. Our story begins with those shepherds keeping watch over their flocks at night. By an interesting coincidence, there were some shepherds keeping watch over their flock just last Tuesday night of this week. Your session had had a meeting the week before that was kind of a a check-in to see what we were going to do as the rate of virus continued to increase in our area. There were two positions that emerged. One was that we should protect the public health and the church attendees' health by going virtual. The other is that the public is still going to Lowe's. I don't know why we keep picking on Lowe's, but that's the example. The public's still going to Lowe's. If they're open, why not keep the church open? But we also decided that we need to be ahead of the curve, and so they, they, think, they thought through the different parties involved, and they realized that they had a choice, and all of us had a choice to come to church or not, but the staff, more or less, has to be here. So the session felt that the staff's concerns should be honored, so they asked me to speak to them, and as a staff, we decided that we would not be comfortable coming to a service if our county went red. Well, as you know, on Tuesday, Cabarrus County was designated red by the governor. We all know that means that it is getting bad around here. So on Tuesday night, 
the session faced the same agonizing discussion. And here's the real problem. Neither side is wrong. We all want and we all need the comfort of the fellowship we find here. We want to offer the gospel to our community. And we all would like to protect our health as well as the health of the larger community. So we've come up with a bit of a hybrid. The best solution we could get to is that there will be a, a Sunday school time here at the church. It's a fellowship time for people who want to be together. But we will still stay safe. You can be as far apart as you like. There is a lot of space in this sanctuary. At the same time, I will do a lesson for the online community. Then at 11 o'clock, our worship service will be virtual, pre-recorded for Sunday, as you're experiencing right now. We are, as they say, we are going to get through this together. <coughs> so let me remind you. I want you to connect with one another. I want you to call one another. I want you to love one another, pray for one another. We will Zoom and Google Meet one another. We can't greet each other with a hug or a holy kiss, but we can let one another know that we care. In other words, we will let the light of Christ pierce this present darkness. Well, if I may segue... That is exactly what happened to the shepherds. Into their quiet darkness came this blazing angel. Our Bible says that the glory of the Lord shone around them. In other words, the ground that they lay on was lit up. I imagine the light off the angel was brilliant. And they reacted just as we would, I think. They were terrified. The angel brought them good news about a birth that was happening right over there. Instead of an address, he gave them a description. The child will be lying in a manger all swaddled up. And that's when he brings in a heavenly host. A host is, a, is an entire army. So this massive group of angels appears, and they give this great sign-off. I imagine it was in four-part harmony. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Well, let's break this story down to see what it can tell us about our present darkness. The first, the first point is this. Fear not. You might think, well, that's a good one. The entire format of this service is due to fear. True enough, and you would be right to worry in this environment, the, the idea that wearing masks indicates a lack of courage is obviously ridiculous. That's how the bikers in Sturgis, South Dakota saw it. Only wimps wear masks. They have since traced those bikers back to their homes, and there are outbreaks wherever they landed, including the terrible numbers we see in South Dakota. We do fear that the virus will continue to chew its way through our population, breaking records every day for how many are sick and dying. Not only am I preaching in this format because of that fear, but you are staying home for the same reason. Someone here told me that the Bible says some version of fear not 365 times, one for each day of the year. I thought that was pretty good. I don't know if it's true, but I like it. It points to the fact that fear is a big part of life. We fear all kinds of things. The great word on this is from Jesus. In this world, you will have trouble, but do not be afraid. I have overcome the world. Obviously, we are wise to be cautious in these times, but as the old adage goes, we are to live by faith over fear. Our faith tells us that God will still accomplish what he wants to do, often in the most unlikely ways. Jesus speaks to his disciples about how they are to deal with danger in Matthew chapter 10. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. In other words, live in faith, but use your brains as well. 
The angels did not bring pestilence to those shepherds. They did not brandish swords. Instead, they brought good news. The news would disturb the shepherds. It probably changed their lives. It was brand new. But they had nothing to fear. And I wonder, do we fear God bringing a new word to us at times? Are we so in love with our routines and regular patterns that we don't want God messing with our schedule and telling us to do something unusual like talk to that person who seems a little disturbed? What if we were the ones to say, I care. How can I be of help to you when someone is at a loss? Let God speak to your life this season and see if he is calling you to a new, to a new awareness or to do something you haven't even considered. Fear not. The second thing the angel says is, this is for you. The angel says, there's something going on in Bethlehem. In Bethlehem, they must have thought. There is never anything going on in Bethlehem. In fact, why is the angel even here talking to us, they must have thought. We're nobody. That's one thing we love about the shepherds. It's not just that they are the greatest models ever for children's ministry. How could you ever find a better role for kids? Just wear your bathrobe and walk on stage. You don't have to say a thing. But the main reason I like the shepherds is that they are the very definition of regular guys. No degree, no money, no prospects, no plans. Their only thing is doing their job. They watch sheep. Today they, they might be the ones spending the night at a truck stop or shooting another nail into a slab of sheetrock. So why is the angel there making an announcement? Because it underlines his message. This child is a gift to all people, even shepherds, even to those who live in a Bethlehem. In other words, even to people like you and me. Because we're all shepherds and shepherdesses. We toil away. We think we are unnoticed and unappreciated. And to a degree, we are right. But Christmas means God notices. Christmas, Christmas means the Lord of all will come to wherever we are and enter our world so that we can know there is a God whose love stretches from the heavens to Bethlehem to Kannapolis and to our homes and our hearts. Always remember that Christ's birth is good news for all people, including you. Fear not. This is for you. And finally, you will find him. The angel doesn't give them address an address. It's not 1225 Second Avenue. It's not even the third barn on your left. It is vague. The Savior is born down there in the village, but you are going to have to look for him. Let me tell you what you are looking for. A swaddled child lying in a manger. Now, let me tell you, I experience God that way pretty often. It isn't entirely clear what I'm supposed to choose. Do I go this way or that? For me, it is, should I retire or take another call? <clears throat> Turns out the Lord gave me Cindy to help answer that one. And I, so I have a little news here. We have decided we like it here, so we're going to stay, except we're not going to stay right here. Cindy says she wants to live by the ocean, so sometime in January, we will move into our home in Shalot, close to Sunset and Ocean Isle beaches. I'll commute and spend some nights with the Strickers. Now, if any of you want to give them some relief and you know of another place I can stay, let me know. I plan to still be as close as your phone or email, and I will be as present as I can be. But we made the choice, and it's actually... Kind of exciting, right? And once you all get your shots, you are most welcome to come visit. 
Well, two things about finding him. First, he tells them what they're looking for is something they would never expect. How could the Savior be born in a barn? How can the one who is to sit on David's throne be in such a lowly estate? As we have said many times, God is all about the unlikely as a way to show his power and glory. Look for the Lord in unlikely places, whether it is in a video call or some unsung moment. Second, the thing is, they have to leave their normal place, if you will, and get going. I'm reminded of John Ortberg's book title. If you want to walk on water, you have to get out of the boat. They have to act on their faith. Now, it wasn't some wild trek for them. They must have often gone into Bethlehem. But it was a stretch. It was a stretch because no one expected this little gaggle of shepherds to come around that night. And it was a stretch because they were looking for something that a now disappeared angel had told them about. You could sound a little crazy talking about what an angel told you. What if there was no baby at all? It was quite literally a walk in faith to go into that village and nose around until they found baby Jesus. But they did have the option to play it cool. They could look around and people might say, what are you looking for? They would give a casual look and say, nothing, and move on because they had checked out the manger in the barn and there was no baby in it. God doesn't tell us exactly where we will find Christ, but he does give us some clues. In Matthew 25, we read that he is there in those who are hungry. He is there in those who are thirsty or those who are strangers who need some comfort and a place to rest. He is there among those who are so poor they barely have clothing to wear. He's among the sick. And he is there behind prison walls waiting for a visit. He is in those places we would least expect him, like mangers. We have to go out of our way a bit to find him. Now, believe me, he is also in the faces of our children and grandchildren He is in the beauty of the skies and the cozy warmth of being well cared for. We can experience him in all those ways. But he invites us down to the Bethlehems, to the places that are outside our comfort zones to look for him. We can play it cool, but we know what we are looking for. We are looking for the truth of Christmas in the uniforms we buy from our giving tree to give to kids who can't afford to own one themselves. We are hoping for the Lord to bless our gift that we place in the red kettles that are around our community. When we support the work of CCM, we ask that God would use that donation to reach the heart and life of someone in need. If you want to leave your darkness on this darkest of Christmases, I invite you to the shepherd's walk. Start looking at those unlikely places and those unlikely faces for Christ. See him in the people you pass. Watch for him on the phone as you speak to people in your workday. Start looking for Christ in those unlikely places like mangers. I'm pretty sure we'll find him. Like that first Christmas, there is darkness. But he wants to enter into our darkness and turn it to light. Daryl Johnson is a retired pastor who spoke at a youth camp that I brought my group to. He told the story of how that very setting where we would, ha- we would have an evening meeting and then find our way to our bunks, that that had plagued him all of his young adult life. Here he was, this Presbyterian pastor, but he had a secret, and that is he was afraid of the dark. He had tried over and over to deal with it, and he knew its source. He had this reoccurring dream that was very brief. He was in this dark room. Someone came to the door on on the outside. Their face seemed scary to him. They tried the doorknob, and then they moved off. 
That was the whole dream. He shared with us that he spoke with a Christian counselor who had a brilliant intervention. He said, I want to guide you through that image, but as we go through it, I want you to bring the light of Christ into your dream. He closed his eyes. The counselor began walking him through it, and as he was there in the darkness, he, the counselor said to him, bring Christ into that room. He said, the light's came on for a second in his mind. And in that second, he saw a detail he had never seen before. That is, he saw wallpaper, and he recognized it immediately. That was his grandmother's wallpaper. And he realized that this must have been an event that took place when he was three or four years old, and it has haunted him ever since. He said he never had that dream again. Bring Christ into your darkness. Now, I told you that story so I could tell you this. Daryl is still bringing light into the darkness. Now he is a retired pastor, and he wrote a piece that was published on the ECO Pastors Facebook page. Yes, there really is one of those. He was writing to pastors who were discouraged in this time of pandemic, and his piece is called, appropriately enough, Don't Give Up. He has five points on why we should not quit right now. His fifth one is that we should go back and remember what the call to pastoral ministry is all about. Daryl writes, He invited us to join him in his work in the world. His work, his never stop working work. We get to join him in his announcing the kingdom of God has come near. We get to join him in doing all the works of the kingdom. We get to join him in helping people live their lives in light of the in-breaking kingdom. We get to keep pointing to Jesus as ruler of the kings of the earth. We get to keep pointing to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We get to keep telling people that Jesus has won the victory over all that seeks to ruin humanity and creation. We get to invite people to open themselves up to the presence and power of His Spirit. We get to help people live in the really real world, quote-unquote, where the triune God of grace invites us into His inner life as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We get to help people get ready for that day when Jesus comes in all His glory, bringing with Him a whole new city. On it goes. I mean, can you think of any greater work to do? To put it most boldly, we get to be a vehicle of encounter. Somehow, through our words and deeds, Jesus Christ himself shows up and gives himself again. Why stop now? Especially when more people are more open to something beyond than in the recent past. What is true for pastors is true for each and every one of us. Sure, there is darkness, but he is the light. He is the hope in these days and every day. He is the Savior born to each of us in Bethlehem and in Kannapolis. And now it is for us to go looking for that child. Fear not. Christ came for you. And if you seek him, you will find him. Amen. Let me recite for you the creed of the church. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life 
everlasting. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. The time is drawing nigh. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. The time is drawing nigh. Children, don't get weary. Children, don't get weary. Children, don't get weary. The time is drawing nigh. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. The time is drawing nigh. Children keep on praying, children keep on praying, children keep on praying, the time is drawing nigh. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning, keep your lamps trimmed and burning, keep your lamps trimmed and burning, the time is drawing nigh. Children, praise your Savior. Children, praise your Savior. Children, praise your Savior. The time is drawing nigh. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. The time is drawing nigh. Friends, there's plenty of darkness out there. It's our task to bring the light of Christ into that world. And so now go out in this world with the light of Christ, the presence of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all of God's brilliant people said, Amen. God bless you all. Thank you.